All right, now we're going to do the feed water half of condensate feed water. So, the review condensate system. Condensate pumps, put into the polisher, add ammonia, go through glancing exhaust condenser, control valves to control the level of the DA storage tank, through the drain cooler, heater 1A and 1B, heater 2, heater 3, into the DA, extraction steam goes in the DA, gets rid of the oxygen, goes into the DA storage tank. From the DA storage tank, all the way back down to the ground floor, and we got the feed pumps themselves. So you've got a manual block valve, you've got a strainer. Down into the booster pump. Down into the main pump. Got check valve. Got a swing check. Same thing on the other side. So down, over, down, up. The box. All right. Then these two tie together and common head. So why is the DA storage tank up on the seventh floor? Net positive head pressure. Net positive suction head. Outstanding. So by putting it high, like a water tower out in the city, it applies pressure on the suction side of these pumps so that they don't suck the water out faster than it's going in and cause the impeller to capitate. Good answer. And then you got a booster pump that is tied directly to the motor which is going to be running at 1800 RPM all the time. On the other end of the motor, you've got a gearbox that has a variable fluid drive, variable fluid coupling. I don't know if those are right. I think the coupling is probably better. Let's see, so the booster pump picks it up to what? 600 pounds? And then the feed pump. Picks it up to 3,000 pounds. And the feed pump actually has several separate impellers, several pumps inside it. I want to say it's five. I might be wrong. I don't remember how to state this. doesn't matter because there's not like a lever that lets us change how many stages. It's going to go through all of them. All right. Strainer. There's a DP analyzer around it. And it doesn't take that much. It's like a, something in the two or three pounds of DP is enough to trip the feed pumps. But it normally runs in the 0.1 to 0.2 kind of range, and we haven't seen problems with it since startup. It's conceivable that after an outage, if we did some major internal pipe treatment, we could end up with a lot of crap in the system, and, and we could end up swapping these things. But let me tell you, they're not really designed to be swapped online. If they were, they would put another valve right here. Huh? That would have been nice. But that doesn't exist. So when you lock it out, you have to isolate it here, and then all that water has to steam off before you can even get in there at the, uh, at the strainer itself. And uh, since they designed this plant, and since we went through two different operating companies, We've gotten stricter on our safety rules and require double uh, valve isolation for lots of things. And so this, if this pump's running at 3,000 pounds, they're not going to want us to just trust a single valve 
to go and do the work. So it's a good thing they don't get dirty often, right? All right. There's also a warming line that goes around the isolation valve. around the check valve. So the point of a check valve was to keep water from going through the pump backwards. Why would we want to go around it? Warming line, all right. So when we're running, the temperature of the water in the DA storage tank is in the 350 degrees kind of range. And so if you have a pump isolated and drained and then the temperature is like 70 degrees, and you're trying to put 350 degree water in it, then that is going to cause parts to swell different than other parts, and it's going to rub, and it's going to tear itself up. So by having the, this warming line, we can let a little bit of water go backwards through the pump, and let all that metal come up to the right temperature before we try and start. And there's actually logic built in that says, if this inlet temperature is more than 100 degrees different than the metal temperature, that you're not allowed to start it. Anybody know what that symbol is there? That's right, it's an orifice. So, the line is like an inch line, inch and a quarter, something in that ballpark. But there is a spot in the middle there where there's something that pinches it down to like a quarter inch. So that you don't have a whole lot of flow going backwards through this pump at all. But if this pump is putting out 3,000 pounds and you don't have anywhere else for this water to go, this pump is going to end up charged up to 3,000 pounds. Doesn't matter how small the line is. If once it gets full on the other side, then it's going to come up and equalize pressure. The suction side of this pump is not used to seeing 3,000 pounds. It's used to seeing 350 pounds, right? So there's a relief valve somewhere in the middle that's going to blow off and blow into the ground and make a lot of noise. And uh, if you're going to open this warming line, you need to have the suction line open first so it has a flow path so it doesn't build up. I feel like I'm discovering a lot of stuff I didn't talk about last time. Did you skip the restart this time on purpose? Yes. But now that it's out there, let's go ahead and do the restart. I know you caught it last time. In the end, you were like, oh, we got this. So I didn't know. All right. So the recirc is upstream of the isolation valve. It goes up to the sun floor and into the DA storage tank. What's the purpose of a recirc valve? Keep the valve on the floor going through the pump. Yes. These pumps are not designed to just sit there and spin and heat up water that's trapped there. It's designed to have a certain amount of flow through it. Uh, so we also need a flow transmitter then, so that it knows how much flow is going through it. Uh, I want to say that the minimum flow is 750 kbph, 1,000 pounds per hour. And I want to say that the pump trip is 450 kph. And there's a time delay. It's not the second it hits 450. You've got like 15 seconds or something for the research valve to figure out what the hell it's going and get the flow back up. All right. We see a thousand 
kph or two gallons? One kph is two gallons per minute. Okay, very good. One for two gallons. Is that per minute or what time frame we got? As far as how much flow we got. Sure. So, so if I'm saying it's 450 kph, then we're saying that's 900 gallons a minute. We got to have at least 900 gallons a minute. And if you have less than that for 10 seconds, then the pump's going to trip to keep itself from damaging itself. Want to do that math? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Roughly 60 gallons per second. Yeah, so 1,000 gallons divided by 8.3 pounds a gallon. And then divided that by 60 minutes in an hour, and then that gets gallons per minute. And trust me, it comes out to like 1.99. All right, back to the main flow path. So we're going to heaters five, six, and seven. And you got inlet and outlet MOVs on each of them. And if you're going to have isolation valves, and you also have to have a bypass, or else it'll shut down the whole plant. And that goes out to the ninth floor. And what's that valve? 142. That's the low load. Water valve 141 and 142 for a drum level control. So let's throw my little boiler up here. Not the scale. Not the scale. <laughs> Another tap off. Switch colors again. Tap off upstream of the local control valves. And what is this going to? Tertiary. What? A temperator. Temperator is a fancy engineering word for cooler downer. Uh, D superheater, it's kind of doing the same thing, but D superheater implies it's going all the way towards saturation, and this is not. This is cooling it down to 1,050, which is still 400 degrees hotter than the boiling point of the water at the point that is at 2,000 pounds. Okay. This stuff has to be. Tapping off upstream of the 141 and 142. And that is because uh, during startup, these valves are shut, but you still have flue gas going through here. You still have steam that's going to the condenser through the main steam bypass. So you might get that steam too hot. You might need to cool it down. So it has to tap off upstream of that. There's other cooling water that taps off this system. Where is that? Yeah, that, that, that's not wrong. All right. So there's a interstage tap off coming off the feed pumps themselves. You got another check valve and another stop valve. And that stop valve is called the knocker valve because the hand wheel on it is designed to be weighted, to have like a quarter inch turn slack, so you kind of hammer with it. And if you aren't careful, you're, you'll hammer your knuckles into the insulation and into a bandit and wear your gloves. Safety first. 
All right, so this cooling water, where is it going? What is it cooling down? Back pass. Okay, it's in the back pass. What was the other answer? Hot reheat. Hot reheat. So, reheat steam, the steam that's already gone through the turbine, it comes off the HP turbine and we call it cold reheat. It goes into the back pass and gets heated up back to 1,050 degrees and we call it hot reheat. And so, this cooling water sprays into the cold reheat side. Try and keep that hot reheat temperature down to 1,000 degrees, 1,055 degrees. Why did they take it off the prop shed? <laughs> Thank you for the cue. All right. Uh, so, coal reheat. Okay. Main steam pressure is 2,500 pounds. So, if you want water to flow into the drum, into the steam, then it has to come off the feed pump where you got 3,000 pounds of pressure, or it won't go that way. The Cold reheat has been through a bunch of blades, it's expanded, it's given up a lot of energy, and it's now only 650 pounds. And so we don't want to spray 3,000 pounds of pressure into 650 pounds, or these little control valves are going to be working their ass off, pinching it off, or wear out their seats. So instead, we tap off, remember I said we had multiple stages built in the pump? We tap off an inner stage where we have not yet gotten up to 3,000. <coughs> And we're somewhere in the 1,000 PSI kind of range. Nah. Yeah. And that is much easier for these valves to deal with. <coughs> what is that guy? That's the CST water. CST. Feed water, cross connect. When do we use that, Josh? Start up. So, when we've been in an outage and we've drained the whole system and we want to be starting the feed pump. So, we line these two valves up on the second floor behind the handrail there. And then you're going to wait a long time and the thing's going to fill up to the 141 and 142 valve. And then when it gets there, then the pressure is going to start building up at the pump discharge, and you'll see it come up to match uh, the CST pump discharge pressure at about 120 pounds. There, how hard this system rattles and hammers depends more on how much air you've gotten out of the system than it does on the pressure it's coming into. So having the higher pressure helps. But, I mean, the lowest speed on this thing is still putting out 1,200 pounds. 1,200 versus 120. You're not pushing into that much. The main thing is to get the system water solid. And so there are vents on that crossover pipe. And there's a vent up here at the 141 valve. Oh, upstream. Upstream side. That's the one that's hiding behind the pole. And uh, at lots of these MOVs, there's little, little vent valves that come up. And the MOVs are kind of designed so they come up to the grate so they do catch air. It's a good place to get air out of the system. So walking down the system, opening all those vents, letting the air sputter out, and then shutting them off when you got solid water, that will make the pump start smoother, and then that will mean that there's less rattling and there's more life on the pump. answer for you, but lots of uh, important valves out here will have a little tank next to it that's just like a little backup air supply. So the air that's going to the valve goes to that receiver first, so that in the event that we lose the compressors, you have a little extra time. And I don't know how they decide which valves are more important than others. All right. 
We said that we use the 142 valve during startup, and that is the first 175 megawatts. And when you cross 175 megawatts, the 142 valve starts coming open and throttling. The 141 valve starts coming open and throttling, the 142 valve goes shut. And there are two different modes. This was a whole different video last time. There's two different modes of uh, control on the drum. One is through valve control, the valve pinching off and the valve opening up, which is what you normally think of as control. And then the other is the valve wide open and controlling directly with pump speed. Now, what make what are we are we at full load about that time when it does that or? So that transition from uh, uh, valve control to speed control takes place at 3,000 kph going up and 2750 going down. And that 2750 is around 415 megawatts, which you'll note we go through most nights. Sometimes we go through this transition multiple times a day. But usually once once we get past the 1.2 valve, we're not going back to it until it's time to start back up. If the only scenario where we end up on, back on that 142 valve is when we are down to one mil somehow. If if we lose a feed pump and then Oh, we used to have this scenario on Redbacks. So this is a fun one. All right, so you lose a feed pump, and then that cuts out two of your mills automatically, right? Well, there's this moment there where the pressure's falling, and the logic is like, I got to save the pressure. So it starts driving those last two mills you have to full speed. And uh, one of the mills, I don't remember which one, was bad about failing the manual at freaking full speed. And then it would fill up the it would be putting coal in faster than it could chew it up, and eventually the motor would trip. So then now you're down to one mill, you've got three to sweep, and one of the ones you got to sweep is so packed full of coal that it won't sweep out, and you got to call in a suck truck, lock it out, and open the doors to, to suck out the stuff. Sounds horrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, happened like, it, that happened like five or six times before we figured out why that last mill was tripping, because there were because we were always troubleshooting the feed pump, you know, the root cause of the run back, and the, this other little, oh, and we lost the other mill too, kind of didn't get looked at for a long time. Yeah, it, there is a uh, document in the operations folder called Startup and Trip Log, and if you look at like the first year of this plant, we didn't run more than 30 days except for once. And we're on day 55 now, and it's like, you know, we, we get 100-day runs. We, we've had, like, you have to beat a 100-day run to get in the top 10 runs. And, and at first, it was like, whew, every week you had a startup. If you had a week without a startup, it was amazing. Because this is plant, because there's all this, this is a complicated beast. And uh, the logic that they guessed and cut and pressed and handed us, didn't work all that great. And there's lots of things that had to be tuned and tweaked and adjusted. And this 141 valve, 142 valve transition was one of those things that I could kick their ass for a long time. Wait that they could change out. 141 valve, we are on the second full design valve. Third, third. We, we had an initial valve and it got repacked several times. And then they replaced it. And then they replaced it again. Uh, the second, the first time they replaced it, they went Back in the day, 141 did not do this throttle thing that I just described. It was a motor-operated valve that was either open or shut. So you'd be on 142 all the way up to this 415 megawatt kind of area. And then you would swap. The motor would come open on 141, and then 142 would go shut. And uh, being able to control on the same valve is, is very helpful. Worked, worked very well. The new 141 about twice the size of the original was in there? I don't know the answer to that. A whole lot bigger than what was in there. Might not be internally, but externally, a whole lot bigger. 
So for 141 valve we got in there is what, two years old, two and three, between two and three years old. It was a uh, Muhammad Muhammad put that, designed that change for us. Uh, it is starting to stick a little bit. And it's not like bad, dangerous, you look at it and think the things are way off. But when it calls for it to go shut, it might be 10 seconds or 15 seconds before it actually starts moving in the shut direction. That's not like a lot, but you get 3,000 pounds of water 10 seconds is going to run, right? It's, it would be if you were trying to stop the flow, but you're not trying to stop the flow. You're trying to change operation mode. It's good. You're trying to go from wide open to 60% on the valve. And, uh, and that top 30% of the valve doesn't control 30% of the flow either. You know, the, that first 10% of the valve controls almost half the damn flow. That's a rule of thumb for valves. That's not, I don't know if that's true of this valve or not. Could you say that again? No. <laughs> I'm saying that the difference between 0% and 10% on a valve has way more effect than the difference between 90% and 100% on a valve. When you're going from 90 to 100, the valve's mostly out of the way. You're not changing the flow area through the pipe near as much as you are in that first 10%. So going from the 96% down to 66% is not that dramatic on the flow through the valve. So we ran into a scenario recently where because the valve sticks, you, you go, we'd ramp down, we'd go below 415. The logic would say, okay, 141, go to 66%. The valve would stick. It would take more than uh, 10 seconds to get where it was going. And then uh, the valve would go, the, the logic would go, oh, the valve failed. And the feed pumps would go, oh, okay, well, I'll control drum level. That's fine. And then... The valve would get the rest of the way down to 66%, and then the logic would go, oh, the valve's working. And the feed pumps would go, great, I'll go back to valve control. And the valve would go, oh, if I'm going from feed pump control to valve control, I should shut 30% more. And that would cause it to go from 66 down to 36%, and then that would cause this flow to get pinched back below the 450. No, not below the 450, below the 750. And then the research valves would come open. And then sometimes the research valves, when they came open, would go wide open, and then when the wheat research valve goes wide open, then you don't have enough pump to get all the way up there and make full load. Because so much of your water is getting diverted to the DA that you just can't, you can't make, wow, what is it, 40, 47 million pounds per hour? Eh, eh? 4.7 million. Not 47, 4.7 million. Thank you, Robert. So now Back check. Well, if it happened again, we'd be at six percent, and we'd have, we'd have tripped. Uh, when it when it did this double swipe on us, which happened to the plant three times at least, uh, then drum level would swing. Drum level would end up going down to minus five. So we say minus five. Zero is the middle, and then. Uh, minus 10, it's actually minus 10 point something, or a plus 10 will trip the unit. On a plus 10, it trips the turbine because you're worried about pushing water up into the turbine, which is uh, solid water going to a turbine that's used to having gaseous steam in it. Uh, it's apparently like throwing pebbles in there. I've never fucking seen it. And then uh, the minus 10 is worried about the drum going empty. And if the drum goes empty, then these tubes that are being cooled by this water are not going to be cooled by the water anymore. You're going to overheat the tube, and then the metal is going to get soft, and then the 2,800 pounds is going to stretch that soft metal and fuck up your, your boiler. So those are, those are the limits. Pretty good about that. Ooh, let, let's do the uh, single element versus three element control. Terry, <laughs> if you're in single element control, what are you looking at to control level? Uh, steam going in. Or... 
You're only able to look at one thing to control level. What is the one thing you want to look at? Level. Level, right? right? So single element is looking at just what your level is. And if the level is below the set point, then the 141 opens up a little. And if the level is above the set point, the 141 chokes back a little. And that's actually a little more complicated than that because it also looks at how fast it's changing and that tells it how aggressive to be on the, the valve movement. And if if your dead nut's on zero, but it's going up really fast when it gets there, then it's already backing off. But the gist of it is, all you're looking at is level, and if the level is high, you back off the flow. Say again? If you pull over, you use the speed of the pump. Correct? That is 100% oh, correct. I described it as the valve controlling, and if you're at the top end, then it is the speed that's controlling, and the valve's wide open. So then, the next stage is three element control. One of the elements is still level because that's what you're controlling, and you got to look at it. What are the other elements? Standing elements. Water flow in and steam flow out. All right. So water flow into the drum and the steam flow out of the drum. And if those two are balanced, then the level should stay wherever it is. And so then the third element is the level, which you then tweak down or tweak up to whatever it needs to be. Uh, the reason three element is better is because when the steam flow changes, rather than waiting for the level to start, steam flow goes up. You're taking more water out of the boiler than you are putting it in. You know that level's gonna start to drop. If you wait for it to drop, then you're going to probably end up in a swing that's going to take a few cycles to settle. But if you immediately go, oh, steam's going out more, and you put more water in and adjust, then you get a much smoother control. Ahead of the curve. And then we have the same thing over here on the condensate system, where you've got single element control during startup, where the Valves are just looking at the level. And then you have three element control that switches to at like 100 megawatts or so. These flow transmitters at very low flows aren't reliable. And that's the reason you got to have single element control when you're in startup. And also, sometimes these flow transmitters can go bad quality. And the level control is more reliable because we got it in triplicate. So your uh, three element control on the condensate is comparing the total feed flow to, uh, to which is the flow out of the, uh, the DA and the cold, total condensate flow going into the DA. Uh, the DA normally runs at 100 inches and if it gets up to 136 then that is a plant trip because this water goes up in the DA and gets pushed up that extraction and into the turbine and that would be bad. And then there is a low level, and I don't know this number, but it's somewhere around 40. You got a lot of slack in there. But there's also a low level and if the water gets to there, then it trips your feed pumps to keep them from not having positive suction head, from them sucking the tank dry and uh, rattling the shit out of themselves. I threw out in triplicate earlier. Uh, that refers to uh, the two out of three reliability that we have on key equipment out here. So you've got three level transmitters. And the way the logic says is if you've got three of them, it doesn't mathematically average it. If it mathematically averaged it and one of them freaked out, You've got two saying you got a level of 100 and one saying that the level is 400. Then you average those together and you end up saying that the, the thing is at 200 or 150, which is over the high trip and you're done. So instead of averaging the three, 
it picks, it goes median, so it picks the middle. So if you've got one that says it's 99, and one says it's 100, and then one that says it's 400, it, it treats it like it's 100. And also, when it comes time for a high or low trip, it takes two out of three of these transmitters agreeing that we need to trip. All right, guys, I think I'm spent.